and welcome everyone to Color Commentary. We are your popper commentators, Michael Petrick and Adrian Gonzalez. How's it going, Adrian? Oh, you know, studiously. Studiously? Um, so. I do my homework. Guest, and, you know. <laughs> he needs me to comes, do my homework. I know, I know. When it comes to guests on podcasts, magic players often ask, who's the one, one of the best elocutors with wit and diction in spades? And we've got him on the show. Uh, say hi, Prof. Oh, my God. You've got LSV on the show? Oh, no. Hello. You meant me. Why? That's a <laughs> lovely lie. Thank you both for having me. It, 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 it's an honor. Thank you for being here. Um, so as with most of our guest episodes, we're going to kind of do this as a... Uh, sort of tag team interview here and uh, just kind of talk to you, talk about Popper, talk about magic in general. And I think we've got some questions about life, but, you know, we can get to that as we get to it. Um, so can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself for the people who have been living under a rock and have never seen one of your videos? Um, you know, maybe some hobbies outside of magic, favorite media, that sort of thing. Well, I don't know about any hobbies outside of magic. I mean, uh, maybe making videos about magic, maybe reading about magic, talking about magic. Magic consumes a, a pretty full portion of my life. But for those who don't know, uh, I am a YouTuber. I have a YouTube channel called Talarian Community College, and I've been going strong for about mm, just under four years now, and I have a, a bunch of Magic the Gathering related videos, many of them on Popper, which is one of my favorite formats, but also focusing on things like product reviews, where pretty much if it's for sale at your local game store, I have reviewed it, I have tested it out, I have stress tested it, and uh, written a actual critique, not an unboxing, but a critical review of it, which you may disagree with my conclusion, but I'll hopefully have shown you how I got there and uh, hopefully help you out in that purchasing uh, uh, experience that you're about to do, as well as lots of deck techs and uh, introductory level community college, if you will, lessons on various aspects of Magic the Gathering. And yeah, I've touched some popper over the years. Yeah, and uh, that, that, that was the main impetus behind getting you on the show. Um, I, I I have to ask, so... Um, you might say it's of... very common for me to do a popper video. <laughs> oh, we didn't, we didn't go for the, the popular pun. Oh, my. But, <laughs> yeah, we're, th 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 for, those, for those of you who are just tuning in for the first time, there's going to be some puns in this. A lot song. of dad jokes. Yeah. For for clarity, I believe that the professor is the only one with a kid. So I I, I, I <laughs> am legally required to make sure that at least ten percent of my content is dad jokes. So <laughs> I try and make them MTG dad jokes. It's for the dad and the dad at heart. Yeah, I can't always do it. I lose the energy. Sometimes I'm just tapped out. Uh. <laughs> just, just fast and furious. Fast bond and furious. <laughs> Um, so we do have a couple other, you know, kind of depending on your interest level, boring or interesting personal questions. Um, what's your favorite movie? And I know that that's kind of a dumb one, but Mike and I are big movie buffs and we, I actually got called out in real life for someone saying you guys talk about a lot of movies on the show and I never know what you're talking about. So it is an important question for us. That's really hard. I'm very bad at favorites. I'm very bad at being able to narrow down, especially with uh, uh, any type of art or literature, or film, or even magic cards and, and such. It's very hard for me to pick just one. And uh, uh, I do better at saying many of my favorites. Um, but I don't have the ability to just say my absolute favorite film ever. I can only tell you some of my... I, actually, how about if I say my top top uh, 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 filmmakers that I, well, I don't even want to do that. I, I don't know. I can't limit it. I like, let me, let me name some. And this is in, I really want to stress. <laughs> I really want to stress. This is in no particular order. Uh, I really like just about anything that either of the Andersons, P.T. Anderson or Wes Anderson has made. So uh, anything from uh, the Darjeeling Limited to uh, Magnolia to uh, also I'm a big fan of the film uh, uh, Children of Men. 
Uh, that's one that I actually taught for a while as a, in my unit on dystopia and is one that I think is certainly relevant uh, to today, as most science fiction often is. I'm a big fan of... Hmm, I don't watch a lot of movies. I watch a lot of television is the thing. I'm really... Uh, uh, it's kind of the golden age of television right now. And oh, yeah. films have really kind of taken this lowest common denominator approach of they need to make $800 million or they're unsuccessful. And just, it's so rare to see a real movie anymore. Do you remember real movies like before Michael Bay, like that, that were just films that were made like cool hand Luke or, uh, 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 a, a film that didn't have to be just endless explosions and some giant beam of light shooting up into the sky or some nonsense like that, but just like a film. They don't really make that anymore, so it's it's hard to have favorites. Are, are, are you going to sit there and tell me that you, you don't enjoy the uh, the loud Inception noise being featured heavily in every piece of media you consume? I don't know what that is because I never saw Inception. Oh man! I have was... never seen uh, I've never seen a Star Wars, so I've never seen a single Star Wars. I saw that today, and it has taken yeah. every every fiber in my body as someone who grew up See, that's watching creep- Star yeah. Wars. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I every I fiber to... in your body. But like, let me ask you a question: <laughs> Have you seen? Let's see, of the films I named, have you seen all of them? Um, I've seen Children of Men. Uh, P.T. Anderson's also uh, is he? There will be blood. Yeah, he did. There will be blood. But have you have you have you seen Magnolia? I've not seen Magnolia. Don't you think it would be strange if I replied to you? Every fiber in my being is just trembling at the fact you haven't seen <laughs> Magnolia. You must see it. You mu- now. I think this is an incredible film. I f- it was moving. To me, it was powerful. It was something I watched multiple times and I found actually affected many ways in which I developed when I was a, a young adult in terms of my outlook on life. It was, and, But I, I don't care that you didn't see it at all. And the most you'll get from me is saying, oh, yeah, you should. You liked There Will Be Blood. You should check out Magnolia. It's an earlier work of his. I, I really like it a lot. And the thing that puts me off about Star Wars is that level of just fervor. I have not – I've never seen Schindler's List, but nobody is outraged and insistent that I do so. Uh, maybe they're like, really? That was a really great movie and, and, an, and an important subject. So, so, so I, I, it's not so much that I'm upset. It's just that I'm shocked that you've managed to not somehow – accidentally see one just because of how how do you accidentally watch a two-hour movie trust me airplanes i i I had a long period where i was working freelance you watch a lot of things by accident quote unquote on netflix I don't think no i'd turn it off i I (laughs) i'd never i've never seen anything on accident all right so so we are a popper podcast and while movies are all well and good um how did you what what was sort of your introduction to popper and what was it about it about the format that you that sort of engaged with you and you really enjoyed i'm gonna be honest with you i don't remember how i first got into popper which is really weird because i definitely did not ever play popper prior to having my youtube channel about four years ago when I started it. So you'd think I'd remember because that seems like relatively short history for me. Uh, But I don't remember the day that I sat down and tried it for the first time or heard about it for the first time. I think I'd heard about it before I had a channel. And I think it was just a case of me I think maybe just I, I when I, I developed the channel, I just consumed magic on every level. I mean, I play uh, and learn about Canadian and Australian Highlander. I actually was just talking with uh, uh, someone who maintains a large Australian Highlander site about a collaboration. And I, I really love magic and, and all of its forms and even formats that maybe aren't for me tiny leaders or something like that, uh, I, I still am interested in learning about. And I guess Popper just became one of the ones that just naturally was a part of my myself and my magic being, where in the same way that I 
you know, am studying and building decks in every format that there is. With Popper, I just was playing it and enjoying it. I think possibly it was that I also tried early on to get paper Popper matches going, and that just became a big part of my crusade to support the format, because it's everything I like. I mean, more than anything is the gameplay, but when you pair the gameplay with just such beautiful uh, things such as the overall cost to have what is essentially, you know, a fully developed deck uh, of your choosing. And yes, I know it's getting more expensive these days and all that, but relatively speaking, still very affordable. I feel, and I know this is a contentious aspect of, of Popper, but I do feel that it allows for a diversity of decks and even rogue decks and homebrews. Sure, not overwhelmingly so, not so much that you can just randomly throw some homebrew together and 5-0 a league with it, but I do feel that it has more space for that than a lot of other formats. And certainly for uh, rogue decks, I think the jokes about everything's in blue are, are, are not uh, valid. I, I do not think that's a valid, you know, uh, criticism of the format. And I just love it for all those reasons. And I also guess I do like a challenge. And for me, I really do see the goal for my work in terms of like wanting to, to make popper videos. It's different than like when I make a standard or modern deck tech where that's just a part of the channel and a part of showing off a deck I like. But with popper, I really feel that there's a cause. And the cause is, is that this format needs wider appeal and support and uh, needs to get some recognition from wizards. I mean, we, we don't even have a proper popper paper list uh, from them, which is very hard when you're trying to organize an event at your local game store. And if you've got like, you know, mom and pop local game store, and it's just like, well, sure, we'd be happy to host a popper tournament. What are the what are the banned cards? What are the legal cards? And you can't even look up popper on gatherer on gatherer. I can't even look up popper legality. That's baloney. And that's just one of the things that makes it a bit of a cause where it's like, you know, uh, I'm outraged by this. Wizards, you need to give better popper support. Uh, uh, we just had the announcement today of uh, both a modern and a legacy pro tour, and everyone's excited as hell. I want to see one popper GP. I want to see a popper pro tour. I want to see something like that. If it could be done for legacy, if it could be done for modern, can you imagine what that would look like for popper? I, I, I am exhilarated at the thought of something like that. Exhilarated. And well, I want to so see it happen. I, I, I know that there's a decent amount of pros that already enjoy the format. You know, Ifro has been doing Ifro has been doing his whole uh he had this big long stretch where his de deck of the day was just all popper decks day after day after day. He was sick as standard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I I can see that, but it was it was funny because the first time you know we we were talking with other popper content creators and we were like, wow, like that that's kind of kind of a bold choice. And then the second day rolled in and we were like, oh, maybe may, maybe this is real. And we know, for example, uh, LSV is a fan of the format. He talks about it on limited resources, and um, I think I think Rich Shea actually top aided one of the popper challenges recently. Oh wow! So, I don't think he top aided. Just for clarification, he was like twenty fifth or something. Oh, so sorry, so I was raining on the parade. <laughs> I, I, I know that he played in it. And I believe yeah, he, even he did streamed it, didn't he? Uh, I don't know about that. I just saw him. I saw his name when I was perusing the challenge deck lists. But but it, it would be kind of interesting to see a, a a pro tour. But every time I think about it, I just think about that that constant refrain you hear from the modern players, where it's like it's better that modern's no longer a pro tour format because now Wizards doesn't feel the need to make you know the quote unquote shake up bans. And I, I recent literally right before recording this episode, I saw um, Aaron Forsyth say that there there are no plans to have sort of uh, bans to shake up the format since. Modern is coming back, and even Legacy is going to be a Pro Tour format. Oh, that's going to be um, sweet. I'm going to be real interested to listen to the commentary. I hope I hope they can get some of the uh, some of the folks who they they've had, for example, at the GP Vegas Legacy tournament because they had um, I think they had Chapin in the booth for a while there. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, he, he he's always good. He's always fun to listen to when it comes to legacy. It's really one of those formats where you want people who just 
know the format inside and out. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm glad that there are people out there besides, you know, our little sort of secluded corner of the internet enjoying the format. Um, I actually have a uh, uh, really happy memory. So I know he is a bit controversial with some in the community, and I, I, I understand that. But I am uh, uh, have a, a friendly relationship with uh, uh, Jeff Hoagland, and he had a period. I think it was during Eldrazi Winter, where he in modern because he's pre- predominantly a modern enthusiast, and he was like, "I can't do this anymore." And I was like, "You need to go do Popper. You need to go do Popper." And this was one he was still streaming MTGO, which he's returned to now, uh, but at the time he was still streaming it. And he was like, fine, I'll do Popper, and it's his first, and you should look it up. I posted it to the R Popper subreddit, but it's his first ever time even playing Popper. He was doing it on a lark. He grabbed a list that kind of looked good, and you're seeing in real time his reactions to the format, and he's delighted beyond containment. And he's like, oh, oh, this is great. Oh, I'll just do this and." Well, that's a common too, isn't it? Oh, look at this. That's a great move. I just, and he's just loving it. And, he, you know, I think he went something like uh, a, a 3 2 on his very first time or something. He later was 5 0 ing some, some matches and, you know, loved teachings decks, I think. But it was for me seeing a highly competitive player experience a format like Popper, which is probably, for those that haven't played it before, something that is laughably dismissed. Oh, we're just playing with commons. And 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 like, oh, that's cute, you know? And it's like, no. And he was ex- watching him experience it and, and just absolutely give the format props, as we used to say in the 90s. And I'm realizing maybe the majority <laughs> of your audience doesn't know what I mean by giving props. But uh, uh, he absolutely just is a delight to watch in that one video as he is just blown out by the format. And then he played it for the rest of the time that he was streaming MTGO and he had nothing but positive things to say about the format and, and, and just thought it was, was, was great stuff, which is why I would love to see things like a a popper GP to see all the other pros and highly competitive players and that whole, you know, lot of people. I'd love to see them working up things in Popper, making more, like those EFRO articles are great. And you know what's great about those EFRO articles is that they did spawn from him just saying, I can't freaking write about standard right now. And and saying, I'm just going to write about something that interests me because, because to heck with it. Uh, and when you get someone doing that, and now this is me starting to go off on a tangent and I'll stop soon, but when you get someone in content creation of any form, from article to podcast to YouTuber, that just does something that they like, uh, uh, regardless, you get the best stuff. And that's why those I remember those EFRO articles were getting a lot of traction and a lot of attention because they were quite frankly, a a little bit more exciting and engaging than some of his usual ones because he was into it and there was that electricity and it was interesting to hear a pro like him writing about a format like Popper. And, you know, that was great stuff. I really hope to see more of it. Uh, I really do. Give a pro a Popper deck day. That's what I want. I want everybody to pick a pro player that they like and to, to, to spend you know, 20 bucks and, and mail them a popper deck and, and see what happens. Or I've, I've thought about like maybe organizing a charity to force pros like to, to like, you know, play popper uh, on their stream or something. I don't know, you know? So if we were going to send you a deck, what deck would that be? What is your favorite popper deck and what would you want to play? Uh, favorite, favorite. That's so hard. That's so hard. I, All right. I you know, I know these. I know you said you have a distaste for the term. Can I name five of my favorites? Can I name five yeah, of my favorites? Okay. Yeah. And this is in no particular order. Uh, affinity, because it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that fling. Uh, definitely slivers, which is the closest I can get to Merfolk in Popper. Like everyone's all, what about Merfolk in Popper, Prof? Because that's like my favorite deck in Modern and Legacy uh, and Commander. And it's like, it, it just doesn't work. But if you replace, like, what Popper slivers is doing is very similar to what Merfolk is doing in Modern. And mm-hmm. so I can close my eyes and pretend I'm playing Merfolk. So uh, I, I don't think Slivers is performing that great right now, but playing it and piloting it is a lot of fun for me, and it's definitely one of those decks. Uh, I, I definitely love uh, uh, Koldatha Boros. Uh, that is a deck with such fun interactions uh, and I think is 
also a kind of style that you don't get? I mean, is there really, like, for, gosh, for Affinity, for Slivers, there's versions of those decks in other formats. Is there really a, 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 a Koldatha Boros version in, in other formats that I'm not thinking of? Because that's got a really neat play style. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think through, and I'm trying to think of something else that kind of has that same grindy reuse. Yeah. I don't know. So I'm sure I'm sure your listeners are like screaming, idiot. What about deck X in modern and deck Y in legacy? It's one of the most powerful decks and defined in that. What is this guy talking what? about? But I can't for the life of me think of it right now. You know what? I'm actually being a huge turkey. I I literally played Nick Fit in Legacy and Nick Fit kind of has a similar vibe of, you know, grinding out this very incremental advantage, playing a lot of fundamentally very fair cards. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's maybe similar, but there's nothing I can think of that kind of has that same like, you know, advantage card advantage engine through like bouncing your own permanence and turning that very specific downside that only sees play in pauper as far as i know yeah. i think i saw what was it familiar's ruse i think was seeing play in modern in in merfolk but that's yeah. the only other card in that vein that i can think of i i kind of I, I realized the other day i was kind of upset that uh you know the days of that being a three color deck are a little behind it because i would have <laughs> really loved to try um what is it? Tragic lesson from our. Yeah, sure. But the, I don't think there's any reason you shouldn't. And that's what, one of the things going back to my earlier comments about Popper is I don't see any reason why. I guess so you're saying like a uh, uh, Jess guy is kind of uh, a uh, cold off a Jess guy is kind of fallen out. Uh, right. Or. Yeah. Yeah. The the the, the mold mold got replaced by Thraven Inspector because right. it's kind of the same quote unquote. But I don't see any reason why you can't put that idea that you just had together and sit down and play and maybe have some good success with. And I think that in Popper, you've got a better chance of that than other formats. But that's another thing. Other decks I like are uh, definitely Is It Blitz. I just did a video on that, and uh, I'm such a fan of it. That's actually a deck that started taking off. It's fallen down a bit in the meta right now, but started taking off in modern, and everybody was calling it the popper deck and everyone's like what the heck is this there's there's you know uh, a popper deck that's that's turning out great modern results and it's like yeah i mean the popper deck's more powerful than the modern one because it's got brainstorm and and counterspell and all kinds of stuff like that and you don't have that in modern but you know what you're doing in modern is cute uh uh, uh and so that's a lot of fun let's see that's four decks and of course i'm always a mono red burn guy i just love burn burns a lot of fun and 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 burns fun in popper as well and you can just put it together on the cheap i mean i mean uh, it's it's most of you know legacy burn already yeah, so you know, i know I, I i think i think it's really interesting because um i i've had people the the two the two questions um the two the when people ask me like oh i play this in another format what would i play in popper my favorite are when people are like oh i play elves or oh i play burn and i'm like great those those decks are just the same in popper like your payloads are a little bit different you know we don't have don't have monastery swift spear or you know we don't have wirewood symbiote and crater hoof but right it, it's the same basic idea and you, if you own that deck you probably already own a good chunk of the popper equivalent so it it's a nice entry point yeah and i think that another thing is that it's got a little bit of that commander feel to it, by which I mean with commander, you can play what you love and you'll do okay. There's no such thing in commander as, oh, I've only got one of the $35 precons. Uh, I can't win against someone's tricked out, tuned out deck because that's not true. And I kind of feel that way in Popper too, where it's like, play what you like. If someone says to you, Oh, well, I, I like, you know, life gain strategy, but I'm not going to be able to have success. Yeah, you will. 
Absolutely you will. You can absolutely do life gain and pauper. Maybe you're not gonna have the best time, but go for it and, and you really can win with that. Oh, well, I, I like elves. Elves are fun. I really like elves as a tribe. Do it. We got that in pauper. Oh, I, I, I like tokens. I, I don't wanna play blue. I wanna just play tokens and make lots. We got lots of token strategies that are fun. I love mono white tokens in particular. It's a great build. Uh, 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 oh, I just wanna do is it. We got is it. We, name it. Name what you like and we have it in Popper. And while of course there is different tiers and there are gonna be, you know, well, mono black control and stuff and, and, and Delver and, d d you know, a couple decks that are always at the top of the format, your Soul Sisters build or whatever is gonna do just fine for you to play and enjoy until we get that modern GP or Pro Tour, in which case, yeah, we got a top, top tier. But, you know, I, I, and I think that's a great thing because it's not true in other formats. Try repeating what I just said for Legacy. Oh, oh I, I like I like, I like life gain. I want to play that in, in Legacy. I like tokens. I want to play tokens, uh, you know, and, and you, you get much worse success. And so Popper is the best of all worlds. It's it's highly competitive. It's some of the most powerful cards. Every time I do a deck tech on Popper, I say again and again, because I want to point it out, this card is banned in Modern. This card is banned in Legacy. This card is restricted in Vintage. It's a common, and we get to play with it in Popper. We're playing with some of the most powerful cards in Magic. We're spending 20, 30, maybe $50 on our fully tripped out decks and we're playing whatever we want. You want to play some of the best decks in the format? Knock yourself out with that mono black. You want to just play life gain? Have fun. Every and every you want to put you want to put that new card from standard into Koldatha? Go for it. You can do it. And I love that about this format. Yeah, I mean it it does have a lot of potential. I mean, we've definitely as this podcast has gone on, we've definitely got, you know, gradually more and more towards the spiky competitive side of things. But, you know, just the other day, and, and I know I'm going to get flack from him for this <laughs> because, because I, I brought, I brought it up in a, in a group chat with, with Alex Ullman. I mentioned the fact that I, I still want, um, what is it? Cr Crypt rats and touch of moon glove to actually work <laughs> because it's this, it's this stupid little combo. It's, it's a, two card wrath everything your opponent gets drained for a whole bunch and i think that's kind of fun at the same time you know i will i will sit here very happily and you know talk about fine tuning a a, a perfect 75 for an archetype sure. based on what i've been seeing and i i kind of i definitely enjoy that duality of you know like when I when I still lived in Austin and you know was was near near a LGS that held regular popper events, yeah I I would show up with, I will admit bad decks because I thought it would be interesting to try them out and with popper like I I haven't done the calculations in a while but the last time I checked like buying a playset of the entire format top to bottom was like a thousand dollars which not a cheap number but if you look at top tier modern or pretty much any legacy deck you're already pretty much there and we're talking about a format versus a singular deck i yeah. want to i want to dig on mike for just one second because this joke's too good to pass up we used to call him grizzly bear because he was always 2-2 two -two. <laughs> wow <laughs> wow that's cold that's cold that's your friend you're talking about savage it's, it's, it's also pretty generous a lot of the times it was one three but that was a savage punch to that grizzly bear uh, um so i want to i want to reach back a little bit further professor i want to reach back before the 90s even i want to reach back well i guess it would have been the early 90s yeah, we want to no, know no, how you got no magic the gathering there was no magic the gathering for the 90s sir. all right we won't go, we won't go back that far then but uh how did you dungeons and dragons back then <laughs> how did you get into magic like when did you start playing well, I got into magic the same reason most, not everyone, of course, but the same reason most uh, uh, people get into magic, which is to meet girls. And uh, my high school uh, uh, lady friend that I was interested in happened to be in uh, our school's magic circle. And so in trying to uh, get in uh, uh, to uh, uh, be friends with her, uh, taking up and playing Magic the Gathering was a really good move. And... Uh, 
that was actually, I mean, you could say it another way as I learned magic to make friends, which also, you know, ended up happening because once you're playing magic, you have a social circle, which for awkward teenagers in high school is a blessing. And I just was hooked. I was always a fan of fantasy. I was a fan of magic, not as a card game, but as a concept. And I just was so absolutely enraptured with turning through my binder the way a wizard might turn through pages of a spell book to select the cards that would go in my deck and build that deck for battle on the playground the next day. It was, quite frankly, one of the most you know, formative and positive experiences of my high school years. Uh, and it got me my first girlfriend, which was pretty nice. And oh, well, oh, that, uh, that, and, that, that and, wasn't a fiction then. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, I stopped when I, I went off to college because I figured adults don't play magic. And I came back after college because, yes, they do. Yeah. Also, you know, the the slightly increased disposable income makes makes oh, it a man. little bit easier. Well, I used to skip lunch. I mean, I would literally. So my maneuver. I had an allowance to begin with. I don't remember what it was, but you know, it's not going to buy you many magic packs. So what I did was I told my mother that I would like to. I, I had always had lunches packed from home, and I said I actually want to start eating in the cafeteria. And so that's, you know, $3 a day or something. And I'd say, okay, and then you get a dessert for a dollar. And I think I, I think I literally was getting that. I think I was literally getting $4 a day from her for lunch. And that was like a pack of magic cards a day uh, is what that was the qu equivalent of. And I would eat a super big breakfast. I think it would sneak an apple down with me. And then as soon as I got out of school at 3 o'clock, I'd be like, I'm starving. I need Taco Bell, you know. And uh, 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 my mom would take me down to Taco Bell. Uh, and <laughs> so, yes, I embezzled money from my mother in order to play magic. It's a great game for ch kids and families and good values. I mean, I mean, I mean, they don't they don't call it cardboard crack for nothing. Uh, yes. But yeah, I, I, I feel like a lot of the a lot of the magic stories are, you know, pretty similar. Um, I do have a question that that just kind of came to me. Um, uh -huh. I, I, you mentioned you like fantasy and I know you've talked about it briefly on your channel and you talked about it briefly in the pre-show you actually have a creative writing degree and i was curious as to your opinions on the magic storyline over the years i think that the magic storyline has all, never been perfect but i think that it's always had good parts to it and that we have two kind of i guess types of magic story, the old story and the new story, and they're fundamentally different. And I believe neither is good. I, I really do. I, and I don't think magic story is good now, and I don't think it was good back then, but there are good things about the story now, and there's good things about the story back then. I think they could kind of learn from each other. I think there's a lot of problems with the way the story is done today, and there were a lot of problems with how it was done yesterday. And I still find the flavor of magic cards, the artwork, and the, the text that is written about them, both on the card and on, I guess, now the websites, but previously in the novels, I find that to be a very important part of magic, because I don't believe that if the cards just had the numbers and the rules text and names such as Attack 3, you know, Defender 5 uh, instead of War Mammoth or Lightning Bolt. I, I, I just don't think that it would be the same game. I think there is that flavor and element to it that is enticing and exciting. And I think that's also why I'm very frustrated with and angry with the direction and style of the contemporary magic story, where I think it's doing a lot of things that uh, uh, are, are, are not successful. Okay, I... I, I honestly ask in part just because I don't dreadfully keep up with the storyline. I have, you know, the very broad strokes of what's going on in, in the magic world. But I definitely remember when I was younger and I, I remember getting the books and I remember reading them. And one of the largest issues was they had like 10 different authors within the span of a few years. Sure. So you just had like wildly varying styles of writing and also like, 
wildly varying scales based on the set because I remember like masks block is all kind of very self-contained and Mm -hmm. like I think I think it's prophecy is the one that takes place like no members of the weatherlight crew show up at all and they were all of the storyline for the preceding two or three years right it's just kind of I, 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 I think that's one of the problems with old stories, that it was very convoluted. I mean, even putting aside the different authors, because you have that now, uh, 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 putting that aside, I think that the old story was incredibly convoluted. It was incredibly unfocused, despite even things like when we got to the weather light, and it, it had this so-called, you know, uh, uh, more fleshed out narrative it was still just you know the weather light how many crew members is it about 103 and uh 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 every single one of them with 15 relationships and it was very hard to follow and there was also a kind of immaturity to it i think that gosh there's i i hope someone in the comments will will say what i'm referring to there was a critique written of the old storyline recently and oh gosh I'm so sorry that I'm not naming the author uh, it was an article writer uh, uh, who offered it and they said and when you get to the point where after all of this since basically since basically antiquities block this battle with Phyrexia has been going on now over a decade in magic's history and and what we have reached this point where finally the Phyrexians are invading Dominaria and it is revealed the ultimate motivation and plan of Yogmoth is petty, simple revenge against one person who was a mortal that died 10 billion thousand years ago and, and slighted him and stuff. And it's like you go, and, and this person critiquing was like, you got to be effing kidding me about this. That is the most unimaginative, disappointing, pathetic that ah and and yeah it had those problems uh but we got those we got problems today too i mean you want to get into what's wrong with the gate watch got 3 hours uh there's a lot to talk about what's what's wrong with the jastus league i i i mean i mean my my main issue with them is you know i feel i i def i remember i forget who it was i was having a conversation on twitter with someone who's way more into the lore and i was like I don't really pay attention to the lore, but I feel like I can accurately sum up the the main characters of the Gatewatch, and it's like uh, Gideon likes justice, uh, right. Jace forgets things, right. Liliana is evil and has the whole thing with the deals with the demons, right. uh, Chandra is a, a little bit quick quick to anger, and Nissa likes plants. Right, and, and it's like real <laughs> developed characters there. Uh, real de- you want to see why why Liliana ended up being a lot of people's, you know, like, like more preferred character in terms of the storyline. Listen to your descriptions right there. She had the most depth in your, your intentionally your intentionally one-dimensional descriptions of these characters, and she even got a little bit like when you go, oh, the deal with the demons, it's like, oh, that's a little, we got a little something there, you know, but it's like, that's exactly right. Nissa likes plants. Chandra is quick to anger. I mean, I, I already did the joke on my channel where I had a skit where I was talking with Chandra, and, and I looked up when I was writing that skit, uh, angry in the thesaurus and 90% of the words that come up for anger in the thesaurus are the names of Chandra cards and it's just <laughs> like it's like this is all they did and I, I say that and I'm like did you literally just look up angry in the thesaurus and use that to flesh out your character like it's just the same word over and it's just the same meaning over and over and over again and and that's really a lot of the problem. So whereas the old lore was convoluted, overly complicated, cumbersome, moti- like 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 when you were at following Urza's plans, and they're just the most labyrinthine things, where it's beyond the point of enjoyment. It's just absurdly complex. And today it's cookie cutter. And so it's like we got to meet in the middle. We got to meet in the middle. I mean, I'm I'm excited for Ixalan because I want to know what Vraska's been up to because she she's a pirate like now. A, she's a pirate now, but she <laughs> seems like she's an interesting character because yes, from what, I, from what I've read, she was like exile, like the Gorgons on uh, Ravnica were like hunted, and yeah. she basically lives as this exile in the in the Golgari sewers and. 
that's an interesting character. I want to know more about her story, and I'm glad that we get to. I, I really hope they don't screw it up, because anybody who read the lore, like, and had previously been a fan of Tezzeret, we, we recently had Tezzeret on, on uh, Kaladesh block. It was a joke. It was snidely whiplash, which I guess your viewers won't really get that reference, but just classic mustache-twirling villain where this character was not a character at all and was literally just like, you fools, I will destroy you. You will do as I say. And it was just so sad that they felt that that's how you write the character as opposed to, you know, you know, something much more complex and fleshed out. And Vraska has that possibility because at least when we first got her story, it was complex. She's a villain, but she also, I mean, her spark ignited as she was being beaten to death by Azurius guards simply for, you know, existing uh, uh, in the Skolgari sewers uh, uh, over a, a territory dispute. And they were just rounding up. They're like, it was the equivalent of like, let's go downtown and round up all the bums off the street street and then beat them senseless for being there. And that's essentially what the Azurius did. And among them grabbed Vraska. And it just so happened that that ignited her spark. And now she's pursuing, you know, what you might define as evil, you know, acts of murder based on revenge for that sort of stuff. But that could be really interesting if we're on a different plane. And I always want to get the planeswalkers on a different plane. And if we're on a different plane and we're talking about stuff like we're, we're, we're doing a lot of like, this is what uh, 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 the, the Aztec or, or, or uh, uh, Latin America, uh, 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 Mesoamerican history. And that's ripe with things like invading forces and abuse and exploitation. And that's kind of what was done to her. And I'm, I, when you see her as the pirate invading the lost city of whatever uh, uh, in that promo pick, I just want to say, oh my God, are we going to get to really have her be villainous, but then also maybe have some character-driven stuff about what is it she's doing versus what was done to her, what is right, what is wrong? Like, are we going to get to do that? Or are we just going to have her go, because I want it, I'm evil, blah, 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 blah. I mean, are we writing stories for five-year-olds here, or are we going to write something interesting? I mean, we've, we've also just got the risk that with that leaked uh, leaked set of cards, someone pointed out that there is a Jace Planeswalker in this set. So. Oh, I didn't know that. Don't tell me that. No spoil. I haven't looked at any of them. Okay. Well, oh, no, I, there's a J. Oh, dude, there's a yeah. Jace Planeswalker <laughs> in the next set. Screw that. I thought we were done with the Gatewatch. Oh, well, well, God. Getting, yeah, we thought they were all murdered. Oh, God. No, no. <laughs> Oh, oh man, what a bummer. Okay, I, I, I have a weird question that we ask everyone who comes on the show. Uh-huh. What are your favorite basic lands? And I know, I know we've had the the favorite conversation, but yes. do you have any in particular that you think are, you know, what, I, I gotta I gotta be honest thing? with you, those Rebecca Gay uh f- uh basic lands that uh were in the commander decks last year and are going to be in foil in the standard showdown. I mean, Rebecca Gay did not do basic lands. I think she did two prior to that. She did one for the uh, uh, Asia Pacific special promotion land pack, like a because she only does watercolor. And she did like a mountain, which I have one, one copy of. And then I think there's a forest or something out there. And that's it for basic lands, I think. Maybe there's one more. But those basic lands, a full set by her, they're so beautiful. She's a real artist. She's actually in museums, and and she's too expensive for magic usually, which is the – everybody always says, why'd they get rid of Rebecca Gay? Man, we can't afford her. Uh, uh, and uh, so that's really tantalizing. Uh, I do like the Therese Nielsen uh, anything lands, but I, I actually rather liked – her original full art lands that were from the first unset. She did an island and a couple others uh, uh, from that first unset. And I know John Avon's full arts are everybody's favorite cliche. And I just feel that the first unset's uh, full arts were were stylistically interesting because you you haven't seen a style like that before, and it was a lot more uh, traditional art being used for them. 
I think one of the other artists was, oh gosh, I forget. I'd have to look it up. But those were some really good styles. For me, it's um, not about favorite basic lands. When I build a deck, I pick the land that goes with that deck, and it's always different. I don't believe in a signature land or series of lands, but rather, I like to build a deck for whatever format, commander to popper to modern to standard, and then I close my eyes and I think, what land resonates with this deck? So if it's my merfolk deck, uh, in modern, I use the Lorwyn Islands, and I don't use just one of them. I actually like to have an even balance to show all the different artworks. But in legacy merfolk, which I also have separately built, I use the alpha, not alpha ones, they're beta, islands, uh, but the original island art, because it's legacy, and we're going way back. And so I go back to those Mark Poole uh, uh, islands and such. And again, all the different artworks and everything. In Commander, I seek, you know, like when it was, f I have a Felden deck in Commander and I use snow-covered mountains because that's, he was after the Brothers' War and that's the Ice Age, you know? And I, I like to find the lands that hit the deck. I really liked the, the lands in Kaladesh. I really hate the lands in Amonkhet. Huh. So I, I actually was, I've been a pretty big fan of what they've been doing with the land art recently. Um, yeah. It's funny you bring up the Rebecca Gay lands. I literally received a package in the mail the like two days before the announcement of the full of the foil versions of enough Rebecca Gay basics for my cube. And the moment I saw that, I was like, that's really awesome. But I did just buy a whole bunch of lands and now I feel like I have to replace them with the nice foil ones. I guess. Um, I mean, it depends on whether or not you like potato chips or not. You like playing with potato chips? Get the foils. Oh, I I, I, I got bit by the cube bug early uh -huh. when I returned to Magic. So I have my cube in a nice box with uh, the silica gel packets in it to act as a desiccant so that my foils don't curl. So... I, I've got a solution it's all about, there. It's all about proper storage, really. Also, for, for reference, for those of you playing along at home, uh, I looked it up. Um, Rebecca Ye did the mountain from the APAC yep. lands and also the planes depicting the Great Wall of China. That yes. one is one of the... I like that one a lot, the Great Wall of China one. That's really and, cool. I love all those those ones where it's depicting basically things on on, uh, on our plane on Earth. I've got to admit the the APAC and the Euro lands are very very pretty, and I, I've recently so I've recently gotten into Commander because one of my buddies from work plays, and I swear nothing bothers me more than the fact that all the people I play with do not you know put any effort into their lands, and it's one thing to be like, well, I don't really care about the matching thing, but when it's just like, I have a mixture of full arts, I, I have a mixture of full arts modern border ones the old ones that still have the tap to add to your mana pool text and it's just like this is a nightmare and this has set off like a deep ocd within me and i feel the need to like go out and fix this for you so but i i feel very strongly about this actually because i think that this is an aspect where something that was maybe originally a bit of a joke in the community has turned into this thing where where I feel it gets a little out of hand, though, where when there's this idea of what better or more proper lands for your deck are, where it's like, listen, the John Avon full arts are the apotheosis of lands, and if you can afford them, that is what you get in play. And it's just like, well, maybe I don't like those. And then it's when we get to, like, for example, like I said, in my Merfolk deck, I don't have one uh, uh, Lorwyn Island. I have a selection of them. And I get comments on that all the time. Ew, your lands don't match. And it's like, no, I like the different art, w you know? And, and so what? What if my lands match and it's all John Avon, non-full art, 7th edition, white border ones that he did and but they're all match it's like so i chose that i chose that that's my choice and i liked it and and went oh white border white border you did the white border it's like, it's, it's, what the hell do you care uh, this, this is what i like and and this idea that there's actual ladder or properness to it and 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 such is just so infuriating to me 
uh, uh, it's someone expressing themselves. You know what I say when I see someone with white border, John Avon, non-full art lands? I go, oh, cool. I don't see those a lot. Interesting. Oh, what is that? Exodus swamps? Oh, neat. Oh, interesting. Is that all? You have only Pete Venter lands from across different sets, but it's all swamps that were done by Pete Venters? Like, that's wild, not, oh, your lands don't match. And, you know, LSV did an article about that recently, and it was meant as tongue-in-cheek, but then people don't take it as tongue-in-cheek. And, and then they, they start to take it as this serious thing. And one of the ways, especially today, where you do, you were saying a minute ago, you fine-tune your deck. I got 75 fine-tuned cards. But one thing you can do is you can choose whatever art you want on those lands in there, unless they're dual lands, in which case you have less choice. But anyway, <laughs> if, they're, if they're basic lands, you have the most choice. So there's no such thing as a wrong choice there. And I think the idea that everyone should be looking at the same ones is crazy. Anybody saying to me, oh, there's going to be a third unset, I really hope they have those John Avon full arts. I'm like, are you crazy? They already did that. What are you, that all you want to ever see in Magic? Imagine if everyone everywhere was playing with the John Avon full arts. Who cares then? I want to see new ones. How about Therese Nielsen full arts for that? Or or oh, or, or uh, uh, Noah Bradley or Titus Luntner or, or, or any number. Name your favorite artist besides John freaking Avon. Go on right now and then say full art. Go for it. That's what I want to see, you know? So, so I, I've never personally been a fan of the unhinged specifically because to me they are just so boring and pedestrian and like yeah. I, I i went to art school and that's part of the reason why when people take don't take any consideration it's just like yeah i just grab grab basics out of something i'm like but you have a chance here to express yourself and it's irking me that 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 chance has been now squandered but you know that's a choice to, that's a choice too my lack of choice is a choice you have matching basics in every single deck you No, own. I know. I'm just I'm just I'm just saying I'm playing devil's advocate here. You know, if you if you don't care, you don't care. Yeah. Okay. Fair fair enough. I will point out all the people I play with also went to art school, so <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're sort of so, you're sort of socially shamed into picking. Yeah, I I, I, f I feel like, you know, they they put up with four years of the same crap I did. They should probably. I, I feel like they have opinions on this, and I'd love to see them expressed. I, I want for, to foster a dialogue here. For, for the record, I play with Portal and Paper, Portal Basics, and Guru Lands on Moto because they're only a quarter. Oh yeah, the 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 gurus. Honestly, you know what, Wizards? I will buy a case of Unstable if you have Therese Nielsen Full Art Gurus as the basics. I will buy a. Like, like, obviously, I feel like those are those are the height. Those are the height of like, I want to make it clear that I love my deck and that I have sunk probably too much money. Yeah, on man, those, card those, card, those, those lands are like 200 bucks each or something. It's crazy. 200, 200 bucks if you're not talking about the ones that are very legacy playable because the island, I think, is like four at this point. It's, yeah, it's, it's a, a little extreme. absurd. But I'm glad that they're now doing the uh, the full arts in sets that don't all have full art lands because my big quibble with the full arts is a lot of them are not planes I particularly care about. Like, I would love to see a set of Ravnica full arts. I think, like, seeing the huge cityscapes in a full, a more full bleed environment, that would be really cool. I'd love to see, like... You know the 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 spires of Prov and like the Undercity and all that. I think that'd be really cool, and I'm hoping that they continue on with that because I think it was really cool that Hour of Devastation had what Hour and uh, Amonkhet both had what one out of every three or four lands was a full art. That's kind of neat. So so so, how did you get your start? in producing content what was kind of the the driving factor where you decided all right i'm gonna do this i'm gonna put myself out there and make content for this game that i love i wanted to see if i could that's really all there was to it i wanted to see if i could um i i was always a creator I wanted to create i didn't want to create just for the sake of creating i wanted to create something i had a message on i had a voice to i didn't ever know what that was 
and then uh, I was playing Magic again, and I was getting obsessed with my cards being as perfect as possible, and I was finding myself frustrated that certain sleeves would split or fade away or not protect my cards. And I was uh, someone who bought multiple copies of uh, uh, sleeves of all the different brands and tested them out, and uh, that became my area of expertise. People would come into the shop asking about sleeves, and the owner would say, you want to talk to that guy over there? And I finally said, you know what? I'd like to do a video. Like, that might be one of the definitive videos about what the sleeves are and what are the good qualities and the bad. And then I did that video, and I really enjoyed making it. And then someone said, all right, what about deck boxes? I was like, oh, wait, right, deck boxes. I did that. And then someone said, what about playmats? And I said, that playmats, that's silly, that's stupid. It's just a playmat. It's just, well, I guess it's not just a playmat because this one brand does get this fra- Oh, okay, I'll do playmats. And then before I, and then I was like, well, you know, I kind of want to do a talk about modern because I like modern. And before I knew it, I was doing videos once a week. Now I'm up to three a week. Yeah, and I've got, I've got to admit, you know, when a new, when I see that a new sleeve is getting released, I, I do wait for your videos because I'm like, I don't really want to go out and spend money. I'm pretty happy with the sleeves uh-huh. I have, but I right. will watch the professor because I feel like I can trust him because you did recently admit that ultra pro is now making good sleeves. So that well, they, me- they were now, you know, full disclosure, the second generation that came out, I, I'm having to test because there's been uh, uh, ultra pro is not necessarily king of consistency, but first generation, uh, ones that came out were were the best sleeves I'd ever used in my life. Uh, uh, just amazing. And uh, I'm, I don't know that they were able to keep it up, but at least for that set, they were. I don't have any bias against them. I don't have any bias towards them. Uh, I just take... I, I, it's actually kind of simple. I just take the product, sleeves or deck box or play mat. I play with it for about, you know, two months. Well, sometimes six weeks. Sometimes a little longer. And I see what happens, and I do a lot of it, and I pass out, I get lots of copies, and sometimes I hand those copies out to other people uh, and have them play with it in addition to me. And I read a lot about what other people are experiencing, and then I put a review together, and again, you know, the grade that counts isn't mine, but it's yours, but I try and show as much footage and close-ups and use of the product so that even if you go, oh, like maybe you watch my Ultra Pro Eclipse video and and I gave that a, a, a giant enthusiastic A plus and maybe you go wow they look good but maybe not an A plus they look more like a B plus to me I don't I don't respond with well you don't know what you're talking about I'm it's like yeah okay cool B plus for you uh, that's great well good to know that because not everybody can afford to buy one of every pack of sleeves you maybe you only got enough money for one pack in you better make it count so springboarding off of Mike's question there, obviously, you know, you started off, it, it sort of became like, well, I need to do this. Well, why am I not doing this? But now, like Mike said, you're one of the biggest names out there and people definitely do trust your recommendations. So what is that like? Just as like, you know, you seem like a pretty average guy who just loves the game so much, you know, it's a little stressful. Like yeah. I said, you know, well, for example, um, previously KMC hypermats were the best sleeves on the market and then the company got bought. And the new owners, and of course, this doesn't like make the papers or anything. No one knew they had been bought. And and the new owners changed the formula and cheapened it. And no one knew this happened. And then all of a sudden, one day, I got a couple messages. It's like, hey, I bought some hypermats, and they really aren't good. I'm like, oh, well, gosh, must have gotten a bad batch there. Uh, uh, try and see if you get it returned and, and get a new one. That sucks. And then there's more messages. Oh, whoa, what's going on here? And and then I, I'm at Friday Night Magic. And my I actually it wasn't Friday Night Magic, it was uh it was a modern deck. I had built a new modern deck. I remember what happened to me personally. I had been hearing some some concerns about hypermats, and I had sleeved up a new modern deck that I built, and I didn't get through one game. I looked down and they all looked discolored along the edges and that discoloration was actually splits and basically two thirds of the deck had split. And I, I was, I, I, I didn't understand what I was seeing, but then in my head, it was ringing all the, 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 the emails I had gotten about it. And, and then the next day there was a Reddit thread. And what had happened too was these new owners, sly dogs that they are, they didn't change the packaging even a little. 
So if I have a pack of hypermats from three years ago and a pack of hypermats from three days ago, they look identical. So, uh, uh oh. And, and so that made it really hard. So this was very stressful on me. Like to get to your question, what's it like? It's stressful because I, I feel that I have to do everything I can with my words. A lot of people want me to just make a video. Like people were screaming, make the video right now. And I was like, I don't even know what's going on at that point. I didn't know they'd been sold. I didn't know what, it, what what's happening. And I can't just rush out and hit record and then say this, that, and the other. I have to get as much data as I can and as much info as I can and as much testing. So I bought, I spent a lot of money and I bought a million packs of, of, of hypermats from all over and testing and this and research and contacting some names and calling in a few favors. And, f- you know, because the whole like company being sold is not like easy to access info. And I finally pieced it all together, and then I was able to make the video. And and in that video, I also said, coincidentally, Ultra Pro Hypermats just came out, and I've been playing with these and a lot of, and doing my research, and those were amazing. Now the Gen Two of Hypermats, or not Hypermats of uh, uh, Eclipses came out, and I'm not saying this officially. Uh, don't viewers run and panic, but there seem to be some quality control issues with the second gen of of the Eclipses. And so what's that like for me? I'm giving myself an ulcer because I'm like, okay, I have a video out there saying these are great sleeves, which they were. And now the second gen came out and they're not great sleeves. Yay. Uh, uh, and the packaging's identical. And and some people, went, and it's just like, oh no, this is a nightmare. And 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 I don't know, but I don't even know still. I can't, I don't know that something happened. There ju- it might just be some bad batches. I'm researching and I'm looking into it. I can't do, it's very hard for me to do a topical video uh, because I really like to have all my, my facts straight. And, and so when I do a topical video, like I did one earlier this week about the discontinuing of Friday Night Magic promos, I was up till 4 a.m. rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and, and calling people and trying to get everything just right for that video because it it, I, it it matters. I feel it matters, and so it's it's stressful in that way. It's it's very humbling. I'm someone with very I have self esteem problems and and suffer from that whole gauntlet on the spectrum of self esteem to depression to that sort of thing. And and so for me, when people say like like right now the the first thing that hit my head when you said you're one of the biggest names in magic is I said no I'm not in my head I said, and and then the next voice said and I don't deserve it <laughs> like like <laughs> honestly that's what I'm dealing with that's what what I medicate with uh and against and everything so there are moments where I let myself let that voice in every now not that not the voice the bad voice the good voice every now and then I go all right when someone says you really do good work, maybe every 20 times, once every 20 times, I'll open the door and say, oh, OK, that, that feel, it feels good. It's true and it feels good. And then the other 19 times I'll say they're wrong. I'm, I'm a fraud. I'm a hack. Uh, I, I don't deserve it. I, I, I'm not I'm not even really that. And, and this and that and the other. So, you know, uh, more than anything, there's two comments I get. More, that that mean a lot to me. People say they saved some money. They learned how to play the game. That's really special. And someone says to me, "Hey, I, I got this great deck box. It, it, it's wonderful. You saved me so much money, and the deck box is, is everything I need. That's great." I go, "That's awesome." And then sometimes someone says, "Your videos really helped me out when I was in a bad place. I found a social group because of them." I just laughed because of the skit one you did. It it made me happy and I was feeling sad. Someone says that because of my own mental issues. I'm someone who, my brain unfortunately, has the default resting mode of sad. Uh, uh, So someone says you took me from sad to happy. Uh, That means a lot to me because sometimes I have trouble going from sad to happy. And uh, so those are those are the comments that that, you know, I do really value. And then, and then, like the other day, uh, someone said on my video where I was talking about the discontinuation of uh, Friday Night Magic promos, someone said, wow, when uh, the, the content creators who bend over backwards to suck wizards' 
<laughs> um, uh, are going to even be critical of something they do, then you know they messed up. And I say, <laughs> oh, that's sweet. I read that to my friends that don't play Magic or watch YouTube. And I said, hey, you want to know how my job's going? Let me read you this comment. <laughs> and, and they laughed so hard. I think my friend wants to, like, stitch that and put that on, on his wall. Uh, 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 it was just beautiful hate comment and and that made me laugh in a, in a in a in a lovely way so it's great but you know i'm doing what i love so so kind of as a follow up do you have any advice for people out there who are you know considering making content because yeah. we've definitely had people come up to us and be like uh, it would be great to make content, but I just don't think i can do it and the whole time we've been like we didn't think we could do this yeah, we no, literally I just didn't... sat down with a microphone and you know here a year later, we're still doing it. Yeah. Um, I, I think that the number one rule is make content for you. Don't ask yourself, what do people want to hear? Don't at all. A ask yourself, what do I want to hear? And ask yourself, what do I want to make? You're creating. What do you want to create? What do you want to put out there? Oh, well, someone else is doing that. So what? Like, I mean, you guys have a, 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 a make popper content. Uh, uh, sh should you stop because Alex Ullman is out there writing popper articles? No, that's and nor should he because you exist. That's ridiculous. You can both talk popper. I can make a popper video. What if my popper video is a deck tech? And what if next week you do? We're going to talk about this deck and popper. And then it happens to be a deck that I and, and then and then you say, oh, shoot, Adrian. Uh, uh, the prof just did a deck deck on that. Oh, I guess we shouldn't have a podcast that week. No, you do your podcast, you do your tech, you know, like we can, we can have similar topics and themes because our voices are different and our insight is different and your list will be different and your take on it will be different. And, and even at the end of the day, if somehow your list is kind of the same and your take is kind of the same, your voice is still your own and the people will in the end be tuning in for you not for that perfect 75. That's what starts to get them in. That perfect 75 you were talking about. That's beautiful. You told If you told me the name of that list, I'd be like, oh, I want to get that list, baby. You'd show me that perfect 75. And you say, well, Prof, tune in next week. We'll tell you that perfect 75. And I will, and I'll get it. And then funny thing will happen. I'll tune in the week after that. And I don't know why. I already got your perfect 75, but I'm tuning in the next week because I kind of liked you. And I kind of like what you had to say. Maybe I want to get another 75 or I want to hear your thoughts on this other 75. But at the end of the day, people come back for you and you just need to make content that makes you excited. And that excitement is what will draw the people to you. So follow that and nothing else. And do not let other people's work into your equation at all. Don't let yourself say no one else is doing it. If no one else is doing it, that's a great reason to do it. It means we want it. It means it isn't there. No one else is doing this. That's great. No one else is, is doing a thing about it. Or well, other people are doing it. Fine. Give it. Show us you. Show us you. Do it would make you happy. Yeah, I, I think that's really solid advice. Like, we, we happen to get lucky in the fact that we kind of started a popper podcast when no, no others were running. But, like, just the other week we got uh we got followed by someone who's starting up their own popper podcast and i was like that's awesome like the it's not competition it's just there's someone else out there and you know in a way it's competition like i still want to be able to be like well i don't want to get totally eclipsed by this person but it, the the additional voices are always useful to a community just having like multiple opinions and the other thing is just for those listening, stick with it. Like we do this every single week, whether we're, whether we're feeling it or not. And no matter how bad work has been, we generally manage to pull it together just long enough to record about an hour worth of content for you guys. <laughs> I see. I secret, I secretly hate Mike is the thing here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, last question before you go, if there was a single uncommon, you could see downshifted to common. What would it be? I All right, it, it was five. <laughs> no, but I gotta say, given how much downshifting goes on, I, I almost don't feel confident for some of the uncommons that I'm thinking of. Uh, 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 I almost feel like, oh gosh, was that already downshifted? Do I want it downshifted? Let's see. Um, I would say that the one that I uh, well now, sh okay, let me ask you this: Should I give you a real answer or a greedy answer? 
the the answer that you want. It doesn't have to be one that's healthy for the format. Uh, uh, for example, my answer to this is always going to be astral slide and i know it's completely unhealthy it would be completely unhealthy in the format it would not be good for the state of popper as a whole but i really like the card so go ahead give you us got it here it is I, and I, I anybody who knows me knows what i'm gonna say here we go the uncommon that should be common just for popper and just for me and no one else and who cares about the health of the format you got it, Marrow Regery, because then I got a Merfolk Lord in Popper, and I can find some other fishies to pump up. That one's actually not that unreasonable, honestly. Yeah, uh, we, we, we've definitely seen more unreasonable in discussions of this. I, I think I'd be okay with that, because you're not like, if you wanted all of the rest of the Lords downshifted, we might have an objection. I actually think that'd one. be kind of fun to say just that one Lord, and then what am I going to, like, what am I going to look at in terms of merfolk in common? There's certainly plenty of them. And, and remind like me that. again, Regery is the lord that taps stuff when a merfolk when something, enters? Yeah, which is really interesting. So whenever you cast a merfolk spell, you may tap or untap target permanent. And so there's all kinds of shenanigans that can go on with that. And then other merfolk creatures you get, uh, you control get plus one, plus one. And it costs one blue and two of any color. I I think I'd actually be totally fine with that. I I'd it's be, not a common I'd be man. Yeah. It's not a common. It shouldn't be a common. I know. There's all these effects that we just don't get at common ever. But apparently, burning tree emissary was a fine downshift. But yes, enough enough salt mongering from me. Um, we're coming up on a little over an hour here, so um, Prof. Again, really want to thank you for coming on here. Um, it's been a pleasure it's been super enjoyable to have you on here my absolute pleasure for being here can i offer you real quick the alternative which which uncommon should not have been shifted to common that was yeah oh, oh g give, give us your opinion chainer's edict really that that's that's your pick for the one that well he's yes. disagree with? he likes his it blitz mike yeah oh. screw, screw that edict <laughs> I, I have to admit, Chainer's Edict is one of my favorite cards. So. <laughs> Every fiber of the professor's being, Mike, no. is on edge now. <laughs> no, no, Chainer's Edict. That's, and that's not about art, all right? That's about what is a common or an uncommon. Although I will admit I'm a big fan of that original art. It's weird, and I don't know what's happening in it, but I think it looks cool. In the the original art, uh, it's pretty obvious. He's holding uh, this poor centaur or fawn lady and is holding her head back, and he's got a big axe, and he's about to, uh, uh, I mean, I, gonna, chop her head off. He's going to edict her, Mike. Yeah. But, but, but why are they both in such stark contrast? Why are they painted up in body paint? I don't understand this. That's their natural uh, skin tone. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a diverse world, uh, Mercadia. All right. Well, <laughs> enough, enough diversions of the artistic nature and, yes. and so on and so forth. Again, thanks a bunch. Um, My pleasure. Adrian, Adrian, do you want to take us out of the show? Sure. Oh, now. Thanks for joining yeah. us today. This podcast is brought to you by the support of our patrons. Consider supporting us if you like the show. Check below this video or the description of this podcast for details on where to find us. And uh, we'll also go ahead and link to Learning Community College in case you can't Google that. We'd like to remind you that if you're listening to this on a platform with reviews, they're always appreciated because they boost our visibility. If you've got a deck list or idea for a topic, feel free to contact us either via our website or by emailing us directly at colorcommentary at gmail.com. Special thanks to Pat's Games and always L. And then, of course, the professor thank you so much again for joining us today uh till next week this is adrian and mike and we are signing off for color commentary